is what God dealt. Good afternoon and happy Sabbath to all the sons and daughters of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and here in Dallas. Good afternoon. For those who may not know, I'm Brother Troy, or either Pastor Troy, whichever one you're more comfortable with. And my reader today will be Brother Anderson. And uh, as always, I, I, I like to start my lessons off with a thought-provoking question. So uh, let's get started. So when you hear the word meekness, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Humility. Humility. I'll take one more. Humbling, long suffering. All right. So, with that said, what would be the opposite of meekness? Arrogance. Selfishness. A proud spirit. Yes. Pride definitely would be one uh, of those, and we know how the Lord views a proud look. See, when people view meekness as a form of weakness. But I ask the question, why? You know, when we looking for a, uh, when, when us men, when we're looking for a, a wife, you know, we want a woman who's meek, you know, quiet, shy, etc. But men, you know, they say men shouldn't be, you know, that we can't be. That men are supposed to be strong and manly, right? But did you know that meekness is a virtue and is vitally important in receiving the words of God? Meekness is necessary to be an effective witness for God. See, our influence on others depends not so much on what we say as it does in who we are. See, meekness also gives God glory. Meekness is needed in order to inherit the kingdom of God. The Lord himself was meek even unto his death. So in today's lesson, I want to show how men and women of God all possess the spirit of meekness and in that spirit, they were given great strength and courage to carry out the mighty works of God. So how can we tap into this spirit of meekness? Prayerfully, we will all learn uh, just that. So in today's lesson, you know, I always like to cover what it is that my goal and for you guys in, in this lesson, we'll discover what is meekness. We'll look at some definition and some characteristics. Meekness redefined. We'll look at the biblical definition of meekness. And last but not least, we'll look at, in the spirit of meekness, receiving your inheritance. So we're going to jump right in, and I want to get two definitions of meekness. We're going to get first the, the Webster's Encyclopedia definition. I want you guys to pay close attention, and then we'll read uh, the biblical, the layman's biblical uh, encyclopedia definition. Webster's Dictionary uh, version of meek, mm -hmm. enduring in injury with patience and without resentment, mm -hmm. mild, deficient in spirit and courage, mm -hmm. submissive, not violent or strong, moderate, meekness. The quality or state of being meek, a mild, moderate, humble, or submissive quality. All right. So the Webster Dictionary definition of meekness makes it seem just like that. The way it reads is you are weak, right? So let's go to the layman's Bible encyclopedia definition of meekness. Mildness of temper. Mm-hmm. Patience under injuries, mm -hmm. long-suffering, submissiveness. It is commonly associated with humility, the quality in which Jesus himself was the essence. 
Right. So what I want you to pay close attention to with the biblical definition um, of, of, of meekness is how many of the fruits of the spirits you see there. Right. Temperance, patience, long suffering, humility. Right. What we're going to learn is those fruits of the spirit draw strength and courage. Right. So with that said, I want to jump right into this. Let's go to Galatians, the fifth chapter. See, because as believers, we are to cultivate this meekness to demonstrate our relationship with the world and with one another. Galatians 5, we'll pick it up at verse 22. And when you get it, go ahead and read, brother. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. Right. So you see, to have patience, you must be meek. To be tempered, you must be meek. Yes. And to be long-suffering, you got to be meek. Amen. Right? You see how, you know, one virtue complements the next. Yes. You can't have one without the other. Amen. But let's continue to read. Go ahead, brother. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections, with the affections and lusts. Mm -hmm. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Right. So you see, in order to walk in the spirit and not walk out to the flesh, you have to put on these fruits of the spirit. I mean, I know a lot of times we don't put a lot of emphasis on necessarily uh, the fruits of the spirit because, you know, we say, OK, we teach the kids the fruits of the spirit. You know, we we on to 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 the law. But I'm going to show you how God view these things as some of the weightier part, some of the heavier parts of the law. Because see, at some point, right, you're going to, or you should, be excelling in keeping the Sabbath day. You shouldn't be struggling with committing adultery, right? Those things. But here it is, these things. This is what you'll forever be working on, trying to improve, trying to perfect, Amen. right? Let's go to Matthew, the fifth chapter. I want to show you how truly important this one trait is. Matthew 5. We'll jump right in at verse 3. When you get it, go ahead and read, brother. Blessed are the poor in spirit. So stop right there, Paul. So that poor right there, that's not lacking substance, right? That poor right there, that's the humble. So with that said, with that understanding, pick it up back again, brother. Blessed are the poor in spirit, mm -hmm. for, theirs, for theirs is the kind of, is the kingdom of heaven. Hey, okay, go ahead. Blessed are they that mourn, mm -hmm. for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Right, it says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So which earth are we talking about right here? We're talking about the kingdom of God, right? We're talking about receiving that true inheritance. But continue to read, brother. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Right. For he they, says, excuse me. Go ahead. For they shall be filled. Right. So it says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. You remember on last week? That was something I was definitely trying to drive home. Because the Lord say, if you draw nigh to him... He'll draw nigh to you. So you got to make that first step with the Lord. Amen. You got to hunger and thirst after this. But in doing so, he'll fill you up. Amen. Right? Let's go to Numbers, the 12th chapter. Because I want to start taking a look at, um, you know, Moses. Because Moses had a title that God gave him. 
here in Numbers, the 12th chapter. Numbers 12. Pick it up at verse 3, if you would, brother. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Above some men. All men. Above all men. And he got that title from God himself. Amen. But we're going to key in on this. Does this mean weakness or did Moses display great courage, great strength? Right. Pick it up at verse one. Let's get an understanding of this entire story. This is uh, we know that Miriam and Aaron were siblings of Moses. And just like anybody else who has older siblings, you know that the older siblings sometimes want to stand instead of your parents. So with that in mind, let's read. Uh, let's read here at verse one on down. Go ahead, brother. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom, had, whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. And what did they say? What, what did Moses and Aaron decide to get together and do? Go ahead. And they said, hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. And say the Lord heard him. Right? Because you're speaking against Moses. You're speaking against the meekest man. On the face of the earth. Continue to read. Let's get some understanding of this story. Go ahead, brother. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam. Come out ye, ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. Right. So the Lord, he didn't call just uh, Aaron and Miriam out. He called out Moses too. Because the Lord's finna set the precedence, right? Because sometimes, like the scriptures say, we take too much upon ourselves. He finna set the record straight. Go ahead, brother. And the Lord came down in the pillar of, a, of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Ariam and Miriam, and they both came forth. Mm -hmm. And he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision. And will speak unto him in a dream. And we see that all through the scripture, right? The Lord came to Solomon in a dream. The Lord come to this prophet with a vision and tell him, hey, go teach my word. But not with Moses. Continue to read. How did he deal with Moses? My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently. And not in dark speeches. He say not in dark speeches. I'm talking. I don't talk in parable to Moses. What I want Moses to know, I'm speaking directly to him. Go ahead. And the similitude of the Lord shall he shall he behold. Mm -hmm. Wherefore, then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses. Mm -hmm. And the and the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. And he and he departed. Right. So once again, the Lord is is, is upset and angry with Miriam and, and uh, Aaron because of their approach toward Moses. But what it is, they're coming against the Lord's anointed. That's what's happening. Let's continue to read, gain some more understanding. Verse 10. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, mm -hmm. and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. Mm -hmm. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. So big brother going talking to little brother saying, hey, listen, <laughs> we have what? Sin. We have sinned. What did they do? Spoken they came up against Moses, who was the intercessor who stood in the stead of God. Yes. That's what they did. But continue to read, brother. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed, mm -hmm. when, when he cometh out of his mother's womb. Right. So, once again, he said, as one's dead. That's how she looked to them. 
But let's go and see what the meekest man in all of the earth, why he carried that title. Because what I want you to understand is that this title that Lord came, uh, placed upon Moses, this came by virtue of trials. This was a process. God was grooming him up until this point. He was tempered up until this point. Continue to read, brother. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. Don't just heal her. I'm asking God, heal her now. Because once again, God speaks to Moses what? Directly. So, that I wouldn't advise anybody else to take that tone with your Lord. Because everybody else don't have the relationship that Moses and the Lord have. Amen. But that came about through what? Obedience. Say, heal my sister now. Continue to read. 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, if her father had put spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out from the camp seven days. And after that, let her be received in again. And Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days. And the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again. So think about that. You're talking about pressure from within. Here it is. We on our way to the promised land. Right. But for seven days, gotta we got to stay put <laughs> because Miriam and Aaron decided it was a good deal or in their mind that they would go and jump into their brother affairs. Whole congregation can't go forward for seven days. We just got to sit here. All because of you, Miriam. Right? But back to Moses. You see how this meekness, because he, he could have took the stance that, you know what, Miriam? You got what you deserve. Right? I dare you get involved in my business. But he didn't do that. Because he has the reputation as what? The meekest man on earth. Right. Let's continue to move. Let's 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 go to act the seventh chapter, because I want to give you some more background on, on Moses and, and his life here before we start. Acts, the seventh chapter. Because see. Moses. Was raised in Pharaoh's house. Right. At that time, they you know, the word went out for all the Hebrew uh, males two years and under to be killed, right? And Moses' mother couldn't dare the thought of Moses being killed. So she put him in a little uh, boat and was going to sell him down the river. But Pharaoh's daughter seen him. And, and Miriam was also there. And when she uh, uh, rescued Moses from the river, she raised Moses as her own. But in, in doing so, she also allowed Moses' mother, paid Moses' mother to, to, to rear him and to, and, you know, um, uh, 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 take care of him, basically. All right. So with that said, just giving a little background, Let's go to Acts 7, and let's pick it up at verse 20. Pick it up. Go ahead. In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. Mm -hmm. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. Mm -hmm. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full of full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he was supposed his supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. But they understood not. Right. So once again, Moses see an Egyptian out there. Be no one of his brothers. He go out there helping. He end up slaying. The, he end up uh, killing, killing the uh, Egyptian. He thought his brothers would understand his situation. 
But when Moses fled Egypt, he was 40 years old. Right? And he's going to go down into the land of Midian, and he's going to work for Jethro for 40 years. I want you to keep in mind that 40 years is about to uh, expire. Drop down to verse 30, and let's read some more. And when 40 years were expired, they appeared to him in the, in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, angel of the Lord, excuse me, in, in the mount, in wilderness of Mount Sinai, Sinai. angel of the Lord, mm -hmm. is it Sinai or Sinai, mm -hmm. an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. Mm -hmm. When Moses saw it, the, he wondered at the sight, mm -hmm. and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him. Right, so here it is. It's 40 years later. The burning bush has come to Moses. Now it's time to go back and get his brother. So Moses is 80 years old now. So this is what I want you to think about. Moses kept the flock of Jethro for 40 years because God was preparing him that entire time. Because guess what he was going to do for the next 40 years? He was going to lead the sheep of Israel in the wilderness. And he was going to need these, this meekness. He was going to need to be, show some humility. Because as we read all throughout the stories, we know that they were only in the wilderness three days and they was coming up against Moses. Only three days. This man had an entire nation under his hands. So God... Being given him a forerunner of of his life to come, had him in Jethro's household for 40 years, tended to his sheep. But let's continue to read. 32, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, mm -hmm. the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. Then said the Lord to him, put off thy shoes from thy feet for the for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Mm -hmm. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt. And I have heard their groaning, and I am come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. Right, so just think about that. Moses was called to lead the children of Israel. But that calling came 40 years later. So you're talking about exercise and patience. You talk about exercise and obedience, all fruits of the spirit, right? All that we learned earlier that you have to have this meekness in order to have patience. You have to display this meekness to be obedient. So you see how God, once again, is preparing him. And through these trials and tribulation, he's developing that title that God gave him. But let's continue to look because I want to show you that this same quality of meekness was also in King David. See, he had to wait on God also. Let's go to 1 Samuel, the 18th chapter. Because, see, we know with, with King David, God was, God was finished with King Saul. He anointed, he had... Samuel go down among Jesse's son and, um, and anoint King David or David in front of all of his brothers. But when Samuel finished anointing David, did he instantly run the kingdom of Israel? King David went, well, future King David at that time, he went back to keeping the sheep. He knew he was anointed. He knew he was a king. Next king in line. But God knew that it was more that I needed to show King David. I wasn't ready just necessarily to replace King Saul as of yet. That I still needed to work with David in order to get him ready to run this nation that I was going to place him over. First Samuel 18. Let's pick it up at verse 5, brother. Go ahead. And David went out with her. So ever Saul sent him mm -hmm. and behaved, behaved himself wisely. How did he behave himself? Brother? Behaved himself wisely. Go ahead. And Saul set him over the men of war. And he was accepted in the sight of all the people. 
and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Right. So once again, even though Saul's the king, David's behavior is not only a man of war, right? But he's also winning the hearts of Saul's men. Yes, Saul the king, but I'm going out each and every day with this great warrior. Continue to read. And it came to pass as they came, when David was returned from, from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the woman came out of all the cities, excuse me, that the women came out of all cities of Israel, singing and dancing, to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments of music. Uh-oh. Go and, ahead. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has, had slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Man, I see the drama coming, right? You got the king, but hey, I got this general that's out there taking care of business. He went in the, he went in the people's heart. He went in the servant's heart. We come back from war, the city all in the uproar. And it's known that Saul only killed thousands. But David, when he go out to battle, he killed 10,000. Continue to read. Eight. And Saul was very wroth, mm. and, and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more than but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day and forward. So instead of being happy for David, because once again, I'm not going out conquering for me. Saul, I'm your general. Right. You want me to go out there and lose? <laughs> but this is what happened when the spirit of the Lord or when you're not right from within. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm going out there killing me in your name, Saul. I'm, I, I got this great reputation because you sent him before. We're going for representing the God of Israel. He fighting these battles for us. But let's continue to read. 10. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as at other, as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David, even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. Right. So once again, looking at David at this point, David, he's meek. He's humble. What's to kill Saul? I got a reputation for killing tens of thousands. What's one more man? But... And we won't read it today, but all you heard King David continue to say was, hey, I wouldn't dare reach forth my hand towards the Lord's anointing. You know how meek and how, 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 how obedient you have to be to the word of God to have that mind frame. That here it is, somebody has thrown a javelin at you, trying to kill you. Mm -hmm. But you understand the position he's in right now? And that you already anointed to be king, but yet you don't have a kingdom? Mm -hmm. That this is the only guy that stands in my way of me running this entire nation? But what David did is just the same thing that we see Moses had to do. He had to wait and let the Lord exalt him. Amen. There you go. Amen. He had to show patience. Mm -hmm. He had to be obedient. Mm -hmm. He had to show meekness. Right? Continue to read, brother. 12. And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and, would, and was departed from Saul. Right. There, Why is Saul afraid of David? Because the Lord was with him. Because you see, there's strength in being meekness. Mm -hmm. Right? Because what we're going to learn here a, a, a little later is just meekness is just strength under control. Amen. Don't view, don't view King David as being meek and weak. Well said, well said. I'm letting you make it. I'm letting you make it, King Saul. Continue to read, brother. Therefore Saul removed him from him and made him his captain over a thousand, and he went out and, and came in before the people. And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, 
And the Lord was with him. Right. That's why the Lord was with him. Not in some of his ways. Just say King David behaved himself in all his ways. So much to continue to read, brother. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. Right. So once again, that's how he went in the heart of the men. I'm going out to war with David. We conquer it, but he also bringing me back to my family. Right? I'm out here with a great warrior, but this is a meek man who's let a man throw a javelin at him. The Lord's anointed at this time, but the Lord's already anointed me to be king, but my kingdom hadn't come yet. I got to show great patience and wait on the Lord. Let's go to 1 Peter 5 and 6. Because just think about that. When Saul, the scripture tells us when Saul's spirit was troubled and he looked for somebody to play the heart for him, right? Samuel done already came down and anointed King David. But what did they have to go get uh, David to come and play for, for, for Saul when, when, when uh, Saul's spirit was troubled? The heart. He was back keeping the sheep. Can you imagine that? Your brothers already don't respect you. They know you. They know you the next king of Israel. But guess what? You still you, you went back home and you still tending to the sheep. You know this man had to be of a meek and humble spirit. First Peter five. But this one thing both of these men understood. 1 Peter 5 and 6. Go ahead, brother. Humble yourselves, therefore, unto the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Right. See, being humble, man, you know, maintaining this spirit of meekness because the Lord will exalt you in due time. Remember, it glorifies God. Amen. That's the key thing we got to remember. Being meek glorifies God. Because you go, we go forth as ambassadors for God. We always have to be under control. That's the biggest thing I want you guys to draw from this. Let's go to Exodus, the 18th chapter. It's not that these men didn't wield the power. The biggest thing is they will self-control. Exodus 18, and this is, this is after the Lord has freed us from Egypt, and Jethro is going to um, grab Moses' two sons and his wife and uh, connect back up with Moses. Let's pick it up at verse 5, if we would. Go ahead, brother. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife unto Moses into the wilderness where he, had, where he encamped at the mount of God. Mm -hmm. And he said unto Moses, I, thy father-in-law, Jethro, am come unto thee, and thy wife and her two sons with her. And Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and did obeisance and kissed him. And they asked each other of their, of their welfare. And they came into the tent. And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done unto Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, and all the travail that had come, that had come upon them by the way, and how the Lord delivered them. Can you imagine that? Because, I mean, we reading it years later, and we like, wow, ooh. You know what I'm saying? Moses got Jethro. He got his son, his wife. They all, you know, uh, reunited back together. And he's telling Jethro, man, and then the Lord did this. And then we was at the sea. And we looked like we trapped. Mm -hmm. And I grabbed this rod. And then all night, the Red Sea parted. Mm -hmm. And we walked through on dry shod. Mm -hmm. No Moses, I mean, no Jethro sitting up there like, wow. Because everybody heard about it in the surrounding areas about what, the children, what God did for the children of Israel. But continue to read. Nine. 
And Jethro rejoiced for all the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel mm -hmm. when he had delivered, uh, delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who hath delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, who had delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. You see that? Jethro's convinced at this point. He's being converted. Mm -hmm. Moses, the God that you, that you guys serve, he is God. Go ahead. For in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. Mm -hmm. Verse 13. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from the morning unto the evening. Right, so at this point, right, Moses sitting before the people, and he judging their matters from sunup to sundown. Imagine that you got a nation of people, all kind of things going throughout the day, you know, people, questions about the law. Civil matters. Everything's being brought to Moses. He's standing up from sun up to sundown, trying to govern and, and, and be there as a priest for all the people. But continue to read. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he had did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone? And all the people stand by thee from morning even excuse me, from morning unto even. Right, so once again, he said, man, listen, you know, Moses, this, this, thing, this thing is not good. You know, you sitting here from morning to evening doing this by yourself? He's going to offer up some, some suggestions. Let's continue to read. And Moses said unto his father-in-law, because the people come unto me to inquire of God, when they have a matter, they come unto me. And I judge between one and another, and I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. Mm -hmm. And Moses' father-in-law said, said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away, both thou and this people that, that is with thee. Mm -hmm. For this thing is too heavy for thee, for thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Mm -hmm. Hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to God, for Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. Right. So think about this. So here it is, Jethro. You know, at this time, we just getting back together. If Moses wasn't a meek and humble man, I can just hear the conversation later on that night. Zipporah, I am over the... Nation of Israel, I do not need any help from your father. Tell him to, all, all those suggestions that he have, I got this. But the scripture says he hearkened. He listened. I want to ask you guys, when was the last time that you were in a position to make a decision but the idea that you had, somebody in, in the room had a better idea, and you accepted it. See, because you have to be meek. You have to be humble. You have to also have a listening ear. Because just because you're in a lead position doesn't necessarily mean that you may have the best way to do it or be, may have the best approach toward fixing a problem. But you have to be meek. And you have to be able to take other people's suggestions in in order to be a great leader. And this is what Moses is going to learn here. Continue to read. Verse 20. Mm -hmm. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, mm -hmm. and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, mm -hmm. men of truth, hating hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifty, fifties, and rulers of tens. So once again, Jethro is teaching Moses how to set up a government. Amen. He said, Moses, you're taking too much upon yourself, mm -hmm. right? You got to divide this up. You got to start working a little, 
you know, silos to get these things done. Now, Moses, he could have took the stance and said, listen, I got this. But that's not what he did. Continue to read. 22. And let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they, they shall bring up unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. If thou shalt do this thing, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure. Mm -hmm. And all this people shall also go to their place in peace. Mm -hmm. So Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he, said, that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Mm -hmm. And they judged the people at all seasons. The hard causes they brought, they brought unto Moses, but every small matter they judged themselves. So think about that. Moses, he understood that this was a better plan. But the first thing he did was he just didn't go select anybody. I know that's a great plan, and I, I plan on implementing it, but now I got to get able bodies. I got to get respectable men. You know, uh, later on in the scriptures, the, the, they use the term uh, men of renown because in order to set the precedence, we have to be the example. But I went here because I definitely wanted to, to, to drive home that, you know, this this title that God gave Moses, you see how it came by trial. It came by God putting Moses through all these different processes and over time, right, developing him because he was going to need it to lead this nation, right? Let's go to Galatians, the, uh, the sixth chapter. And this is the scripture I put in here because this is, this is one of my favorite scriptures because this is one that keeps me balanced. You know, I always like to reflect back on this scripture. Galatians 6 and 3. When you get it, go ahead and read, brother. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Right, because it's real easy. The scripture tells us that knowledge puffeth up. Right. But we know that it is the meek and the humble that the Lord can deal with. Because, see, you can have the truth, but if it can't be received, what good is it? If you can't go forth in meekness to show someone what it is that someone has shown you. It's not like we came up with this great knowledge. E either we came across it and some man had to lead and guide us. Right? Or we heard a video. Mm -hmm. Somehow we came in contact with the information. Mm -hmm. So you merely just trying to pass it on something that you saw importance in. So you sometimes you have to humble yourself down. Right? And, 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 and do just that. So at this point, I want to trans transition just a little bit. See, we read the definition and seen some pretty good examples of meekness. You know? And um, now I want to stop. Thank you for joining us here at the Israel of God Dallas. We look forward to seeing you again.